the hammer of God. Before we get started, I just want to say hi to Amy. She's a new subscriber and asked me to say hello. The little village of Boham Beacon was perched on a hill so steep that the tall spire of its church seemed only like the peak of a small mountain. At the foot of the church stood a smithy, generally red with fires and always littered with hammers and scraps of iron. Opposite to this, over a rude cross of cobbled paths, was the Blue Boar, the only inn of the place. It was upon this crossway, in the lifting of a leaden and silver daybreak, that two brothers met in the street and spoke. Though one was beginning the day and the other finishing it, the Reverend and Honorable Wilford Bohan was very devout and was making his way to some austere exercises of prayer or contemplation at dawn. Colonel, the Honorable Norman Bohan, his elder brother, was by no means devout and was sitting in the evening dress on the bench outside the Blue Boar, drinking what the philosophic observer was free to regard either as his last class on Thursday or his first on Wednesday. The colonel was not particular. The Bohans were one of the very few aristocratic families really dating from the Middle Ages, and their pennon had actually seen Palestine. But it is a great mistake to suppose that such houses stand high in chivalric tradition. Few except the poor preserve traditions. Aristocrats live not in traditions, but in fashions. The Bohans had been Mohawks under Queen Anne and Mashers under Queen Victoria. But like more than one of the really ancient houses, they had rotted in the last two centuries into mere drunkards and dandy degenerates, till there had even come a whisper of insanity. Certainly there was something hardly human about the colonel's wolfish pursuit of pleasure and his chronic resolution not to go home till morning had a touch of the hideous clarity of insomnia. He was a tall, fine animal, elderly, but had hair still startlingly yellow. He would have looked more blonde and leonine, but his blue eyes were sunk so deep in his face that they looked black. They were a little too close together. He had very long yellow mustaches, on each side of them a fold or furrow from nostril to jowl, so that a sneer seemed cut into his face. Over his evening clothes, he wore a curious pale yellow coat that looked more like a very yellow dressing gown than an overcoat, and on the back of his head was stuck an extraordinary broad-brimmed hat of a bright green color. Evidently, some oriental curiosity caught up at random. He was proud of appearing in such incongruous attires, proud of the fact that he always made them look congruous. His brother, the curate, had also the yellow hair and the elegance, but he was buttoned up to the chin in black, and his face was clean-shaven, cultivated, and a little nervous. He seemed to live for nothing but his religion, but there were some who said, notably the blacksmith who was a Presbyterian, that it was a love of Gothic architecture rather than of God, and that his haunting of the church like a ghost was only another and purer turn of the almost morbid thirst for beauty, which sent his brother raging after women and wine. This charge was doubtful, while the man's practical piety was indubitable. Indeed, the charge was mostly an ignorant misunderstanding of the love of solitude and secret prayer, and was founded on his being often found kneeling, not before the altar, but in peculiar places, in the crypts or galleries, or even in the belfry. He was at the moment about to enter the church through the yard of the smithy, but stopped and frowned a little as he saw his brother's cadaverous eyes staring in the same direction. On the hypothesis that the colonel was interested in the church, he did not waste any speculations. There only remained the blacksmith shop, and though the blacksmith was a Puritan and none of his people, Wilford Brohan had heard some scandals about a beautiful and rather celebrated wife. He flung a suspicious look across the shed, and the colonel stood up laughing to speak to him. Good morning, Wilford, he said. Like a good landlord, I'm watching sleeplessly over my people. 
I'm going to call on the blacksmith. Wilfred looked at the ground and said, The blacksmith is out. He's over at Greenford. I know, answered the other with silent laughter. That's why I'm calling on him. Norman, said the cleric, with his eye on a pebble in the road, are you ever afraid of thunderbolts? What do you mean, asked the colonel. Is your hobby meteorology? I mean, said Wilford, without looking up, do you ever think that God might strike you in the street? I beg your pardon, said the colonel. I see your hobby is folklore. I know your hobby is blasphemy, retorted the religious man, stung in the one live place of his nature. But if you do not fear God, you have good reason to fear man. The elder raised his eyebrows politely. Fear man, he said. Barnes, the blacksmith, is the biggest and strongest man for 40 miles around, said the clergyman sternly. I know you are no coward or weakling, but he could throw you over the wall. This struck home being true, and the lowering line by mouth and nostril darkened and deeper. For a moment, he stood with the heavy sneer on his face, but in an instant, Colonel Bohan had recovered his own cruel good humor and laughed, showing two dog-like front teeth under his yellow mustache. In that case, my dear Wilfred, he said quite carelessly, it was wise for the last of the Bohans to come out partially in armor. And he took off the queer round hat covered with green, showing that it was lined within with steel. Wilford recognized it indeed as a light Japanese or Chinese helmet torn down from a trophy that hung in the old family hall. It was the first hat to hand, explained his brother airily. Always the nearest hat and the nearest woman. The blacksmith is away at Greenford, said Wilford quietly. The time of his return is unsettled. And with that, he turned and went into the church with bowed head, crossing himself like one who wishes to be quit of an unclean spirit. He was anxious to forget such grossness in the cool twilight of his tall Gothic cloisters. But on that morning, it was fated that his still round of religious exercises should be everywhere arrested by small shocks. As he entered the church, hitherto always empty at that hour, a kneeling figure rose hastily to its feet and came toward the full daylight of the doorway. When the curate saw it, he stood still with surprise, for the early worshiper was none other than the village idiot, a nephew of the blacksmith, one who neither would nor could care for the church or for anything else. He was always called Mad Joe and seemed to have no other name. He was a dark, strong, slouching lad with a heavy white face, dark, straight hair, and mouth always open. As he passed the priest, his moon-calf countenance gave no hint of what he had been doing or thinking of. He had never been known to pray before. What sort of prayers was he saying now? Extraordinary prayers, surely. Wilfred Bohun stood rooted to the spot long enough to see the idiot go out into the sunshine and even to see his dissolute brother hail him with a sort of avuncular jocularity. The last thing he saw was the colonel throwing pennies at the open mouth of Joe with the serious appearance of trying to hit it. This ugly sunlit picture of the stupidity and cruelty of the earth sent the ascetic finally to his prayers for purification and new thoughts. He went up to a pew in the gallery, which brought him under a colored window which he loved and which always quieted his spirit, a blue window with an angel carrying lilies. There he began to think less about the half-wit with his livid face and mouth like a fish. He began to think less of his evil brother, pacing like a lean lion in his horrible hunger. He sank deeper and deeper into those cold and sweet colors of silver blossoms and sapphire sky. In this place, half an hour afterward, he was found by Gibbs, the village cobbler, who had been sent for him in some haste. He got to his feet with promptitude, for he knew that no small matter would have brought Gibbs into such a place at all. The cobbler was, as in many villages, an atheist, and his appearance in church was a shade more extraordinary than Mad Joe's. It was a morning of theological enigmas. What is it? asked Wilford Bohan rather stiffly. 
but putting out a trembling hand for his hat. The atheist spoke in a tone that, coming from him, was quite startling respectful, and, even as it were, huskily sympathetic. You must excuse me, sir, he said in a hoarse whisper, but we didn't think it right not to let you know at once. I'm afraid a rather dreadful thing has happened, sir. I'm afraid your brother... Wilford clenched his frail hands. What devilry has he done now, he cried in involuntary passion. Why, sir, said the cobbler, coughing, I'm afraid he's done nothing and won't do anything. I'm afraid he's done for, sir. You had really better come down, sir. The curate followed the cobbler down a short winding stair which brought them out at an entrance rather higher than the street. Bohun saw the tragedy in one glance, flat underneath him like a plan. In the yard of the smithy were standing five or six men, mostly in black, one in an inspector's uniform. They included the doctor, the Presbyterian minister, and the priest from the Roman Catholic chapel to which the blacksmith's wife belonged. The latter was speaking to her indeed very rapidly in an undertone as she, a magnificent woman with red-gold hair, was sobbing blindly on a bench. Between these two groups, and just clear of the main heap of the hammers, lay a man in evening dress, spread-eagled and flat on his face. From the height above, Wilford could have sworn to every item of his costume and appearance, down to the bohun ring upon his fingers. But the skull was only a hideous splash, like a star of blackness and blood. Wilford Bohun gave but one glance and ran down the steps into the yard. The doctor, who was the family physician, saluted him, but he scarcely took any notice. He could only stammer out, My brother is dead. What does it mean? What is this horrible mystery? There was an unhappy silence, and then the cobbler, the most outspoken man present, answered, Plenty of horror, sir, he said, but not much mystery. What do you mean? asked Wilford, with a white face. It's plain enough, answered Gibbs. There was only one man for 40 miles around that could have struck such a blow as that, and he's the man that had the most reason to. We must not prejudge anything, put in the doctor, a tall black bearded man, rather nervously. But it is competent for me to corroborate what Mr. Gibbs says about the nature of the blow, sir. It is an incredible blow. Mr. Gibbs says that only one man in this district could have done it. I should have said myself, that nobody could have done it. A shudder of superstition went through the slight figure of the curate. I can hardly understand, he said. Mr. Bowen, said the doctor in a low voice, metaphors literally fail me. It is inadequate to say that the skull was smashed to bits like an eggshell. Fragments of bone were driven into the body and the ground like bullets into a mud wall. It was the hand of a giant. He was silent a moment, looking grimly through his glasses. Then he added, The thing has one advantage, that it clears most people of suspicion at one stroke. If you or I or any normally made man in the country were accused of this crime, we should be acquitted as an infant should be acquitted of stealing the Nelson column. That's what I say, repeated the cobbler obstinately. There's only one man that could have done it, and he's the man that would have done it. Where's Simeon Barnes, the blacksmith? He's over at Greenford, faltered the curate. More likely over in France, muttered the cobbler. No, he is in neither of those places, said a small and colorless voice, which came from the little Roman priest who had joined the group. As a matter of fact, he's coming up the road at this minute. The little priest was not an interesting man to look at, having stubbly brown hair, and a round and stolid face. But if he had been as splendid as Apollo, no one would have looked at him at that moment. Everyone turned round and peered at the pathway which wound across the plain below, along which was indeed walking, at his own huge stride with a hammer on his shoulder, Simeon the smith. He was a bony and gigantic man with deep, dark, sinister eyes and a dark chin beard. He was walking and talking quietly with two other men, and though he was never especially cheerful, he seemed quite at his ease. My God, cried the atheistic cobbler, and there's the hammer he did it with. 
No, said the inspector, a sensible looking man with a sandy mustache, speaking for the first time. There's the hammer he did it with over there by the church wall. We have left it and the body exactly as they are. All glanced around, and the short priest went across and looked down in silence, the tool where it lay. It was one of the smallest and lightest of the hammers, and would not have caught the eye among the rest. But on the iron edge of it were blood and yellow hair. And we'll continue with this story in the next video. Make sure you come back. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.